Good evening. I'm coming to you tonight, this Good Friday, uh, just to share a few thoughts about what our Lord and Savior went through on the cross. I want to look at two different sets of scriptures uh, tonight, one in the New Testament, one in the Old. But through those two sets of scriptures, those two particular chapters, I believe we have in great detail all six hours that our Lord spent on the cross. And so I pray that as I, I read these scriptures tonight and share a few thoughts, that you ponder the price that the Lord paid for our sins, that we might have the opportunity to be where He is today in the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, I, I know a lot of times that when we enter into this, this season of, of Easter and Good Friday services, uh, that it begins to, to shape and mold us and gets our thoughts and our hearts right, and puts us in a frame of mind uh, to really help us understand just how much our Lord and Savior loved us. You know, in the garden the night before he would be crucified, the night of his arrest, that to know that not only did Christ pray for himself, he was going to need a lot of strength to go through what he was about to go through the very next morning, but you know, he prayed for his disciples, but he prayed for those followers yet to come. He, play, he prayed for you and I. And to know that I was on his heart, that you were on his heart, uh, leading up to the moments before he would be arrested and then eventually crucified, is just uh, completely amazing to me. It just blows me away. And to know that I was on his heart and mine, even as he hung on the cross. And so I pray today through Scripture that you begin to understand if you haven't already understood, but if you begin to understand just the price that the Lord paid for our sins, that He might have a right relationship, that we might have a right relationship with Him. And so I want to read uh, Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to look at verses 30 through, 32 through 44, and then uh, we'll discuss them uh, in sections as we go forward. So it says in God's Word in Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 32. Now as they came out, they found a man from Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. Then they crucified him, divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders and said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reveled him in the same manner. So, it's one thing for someone to pay the penalty for the crimes that they have committed. But for an innocent man to pay for the crimes that he had never committed is quite horrible. But even above that, you see the religious leaders of that day in that community coming out and mocking Jesus. So we can see that the Lord Jesus Christ went through much pain. It was, it was even far greater than just physical pain. Physical pain is bad enough. But when you think about the mental pain that he went through, the emotional pain that he went through, seeing the pain of his loved ones, uh, our Christ went through so much agony, and he did it because of his love for us. Well, I want to talk about the physical pain. Back in verse 33 and 34, it says that when uh, Christ finally got to the top of the hill, you know, he had been scourged, he had been beaten, he had been whipped. And to scourge, if you don't know what scourging is, they would take a whip and they would tie pieces of, of metal, sharp pieces of metal, glass, sharp rocks, and when they would strike someone with it, in this, this case being the Lord, 
and when it would come across their backs and when they pull that that whip back it would literally dig into the flesh and so you can understand that Christ was badly beaten uh, I believe he was beaten so badly that even his mother would have a hard time recognizing him if she didn't know that's who he was uh, being tortured at that time and so he went through much physical pain and so when they got to the top of the hill they offered him uh, a drink and I believe this drink uh, was was mixed with vinegar and and gall and if you read uh, I think it's Psalm 69 it kind of describes that drink a little bit and it's actually is proven to be a form of a, a painkiller and so we could look at that it was it was a show of mercy from his torturers that they saw the great deal of pain that he was in and they wanted to him to have a little relief of his pain uh, actually I don't I don't think that was the case I actually think they gave it to him so that it would prolong his death a little longer because these torturers were very good at what they did and they enjoyed their work and so I think they just wanted to keep Christ alive just a little bit longer to put a little bit more pain on him uh, but either way Christ refused to drink it uh, it had some wine in it vinegar and some different they call it gall and just different things uh, that they may have put in that and it used as a painkiller but Christ would not receive it uh, one of the reasons I believe is we were worth the pain you know Christ w wanted to feel every ounce of, of pain that he could feel because he wanted to prove his love for you and I he did it he proved it verse 35 and 36 talks about the shame that he went through it says that they stripped him of his clothes and they actually gambled for them uh, they cast lots for them that means they gambled for his clothes and so we come to the realization that Christ hung on the cross naked now this was a very very humble man lived a, a very modest life he lived a life without sin and at the foot of the cross would be his mother would be one of his disciples John would be Mary Magdalene and some of the other ladies some of the some of the ladies that were very close to him and they called him teacher that that sat at his feet on many occasions and so now he's hanging before them completely naked and so you you can imagine the shame that he felt and again he endured it because of his great love for us the next thing he, he goes through in verses 37 through 44 is the mockery and denial of himself that he is the Christ child that he is the Son of God and so I think the biggest form of mockery was them proclaiming that he wasn't who he said he was if he is the Son of God let him come down now or let God take him off the cross and they began to mock him even though they saw many miracles they saw Lazarus come out of the grave at the word of Christ and the Pharisees the religious leaders at that time they even thought about killing Lazarus because they were afraid people were going to believe in Jesus I want to remind you that the religious leaders at that time were great scholars of the Old Testament of the prophecies and so they had Psalms 22 that describes in detail the very words that Christ would say on the cross and they had to be reminded when Christ spoke certain things that hey he's he's speaking scripture and actually he was fulfilling prophecy but their hatred for the Lord was so great that they would not admit that they were wrong and so they would continue to deny him they would continue to mock him and that takes us up through the first three hours now if we go to Psalms chapter 22 I think we have in great detail in the first 21 verses the next three hours the last three hours and he starts off on that um, third hour going into the fourth hour he says my God my God why hast thou forsaken me why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning oh my God I cry in the daytime but you do not hear in the night season I am not and I'm not silent my God my God 
Why hast thou forsaken me? At this very moment, Christ is alone. I know that the soldiers were there, the religious rulers were there, his mother was there, his disciple was there, some of his followers were there. But at this very moment, Christ was alone. Because the Father had to look away. Sin, my sin, your sin, was about to be placed on his shoulders. And so the Father, who can look, cannot look upon sin, can have nothing to do with sin, turned away from his son, his only son. So Christ is alone. He's forsaken. I believe this was the most difficult hour. You see, for Christ to pay the penalty for our sins, he couldn't pay it through his life. He had to pay it through his death. He also knew that God, the Father, is a holy God and can have nothing to do with sin. And he cries out, My God, my God. Eloi, Eloi, la mach sabachthani, if I'm pronouncing that right. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Christ was completely alone. And again, I say this was probably the most difficult hour for Jesus Christ as he hung on that tree down in verse 7 and 8 in chapter 22 the book of Psalms says all those who seek me ridicule me they shoot out the lip they shake the head saying he trusted in the Lord let him rescue him let him deliver him since he delights in him even though there were mockery and denial of Christ this is the moment that we see and read and here, in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, where the Lord Jesus Christ says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, you've got to keep in mind, the Lord Jesus Christ is just about bled out. He is dehydrated. He is beaten even beyond recognition. His body is swollen. I don't know how he's, he's got his thoughts together at this point. And just to, just to keep himself from suffocating, he would have to press down on those nails in his feet or that nail on his feet to, to, to raise up just a little bit so he could catch a breath to even say a word could you imagine the pain that's going through his entire body if you if you were to strike your your thumb with a hammer and you know, I'm sure many of us have done that you know putting a nail in a in a piece of wood or, or doing some roofing and you miss the nail and hit your thumb not only does your thumb hurt but your entire body begins to ache and so when Christ would have to push up on those nails with his feet, I believe that that pain just radiated up through his body. And to be able to do that for six hours is, I can't understand it. I can't understand how he did it other than to say he's the son of God and his love is so great for us that he would endure those six hours and he would even say to those that were killing him crucifying him torturing mocking mocking him and denying him father forgive them for they know not what they do verse 9 and 10 he has thoughts of his mother it says that he says but you are he who took me out of the womb you made me trust while on my mother's breast I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb you have been my God and so he's talking about you, know, you, Mother Mary, how God gave Mary charge of this, this Christ child and she raised him and loved him. And now he's looking down from, from the cross, he, at the foot of the cross, he sees his mother in great agony. In great agony. And I can't imagine what she was going through. And so that caused our Lord and Savior great pain as well. Verse 15 and 18, he now comes to the near the end of, of his death. He says, my, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For the dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. The Lord is at the near the end he's near the end of his physical strength he's come to that place of exhaustion and his life is clinging to him 
and he's about to leave this world. And I believe he begins to groan in his spirit. And he's just groanings that no mother would ever want to hear their child groan with. But that, that's where he's at. And in verse 19 through 21 says, But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of wild oxen. And at that merry moment, the Lord Jesus Christ says in the Gospels, It is finished. He gives up his spirit, giving us victory. The veil, the curtain, and the temple is torn in two. And, and proving to us that we can go right now into the throne room of God. Into his presence and, and, and pray and praise and give him glory. So I pray on this good Friday that you recognize the price that Christ paid. And that, and that you are pondering his great love for you and you surrender your whole heart to him in Jesus Christ's name.